Hello, ABSKL, thanks for logging on. I have got, currently, I think I may have just screamed live on air. That is hilarious. Uh, it's really funny. Okay, so I've got like 10 people waiting now, which is really cool. Thanks guys for coming. We're gonna be doing a crash course in States of Matter and Diffusion. I know that this is the topic that everyone feels like they should know. It's the one that you guys probably got taught in chemistry earliest, kind of year eight, year nine stuff, but it was ranked fifth in the worst answered questions on the BSKL mock. So I thought I'd do a crash course on it, go through some exam questions. I hope all you guys have had an opportunity to have a look at the preliminary questions that are set you guys, and you've gone all through them, you've marked them, check to see how you've gone on. And then you can do the preliminary work as follow-up after the crash course. And hopefully we're going to see some continued outstanding progress. That's what we'd like to see. I have to say, I think 21st century teaching at its best. So we've got nine people watching. I'm going to start in two minutes. I'm just going to quickly go and grab my tablet pen. Okay, guys. Right. Hey, Mohammed. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks, Mira. Mi uh, Mira, I, I completely agree. I, I mean, I am the, the coolest teacher that I know. Definitely. <clears throat> uh, really interesting that uh, Johan said that this is. Mm, Lucas, are you writing in Bahasa? So I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> uh, I love that Johan said that this is more biology than chemistry. Well, oh, that was hilarious. Uh, okay, so I'm going to get straight into it. Let's have a look at sharing my screen, and then I'm going to have a look at the questions and worksheets that I set you guys. Okay, I get my crazy screen, and I'm gone. And what hopefully you should be able to see is, so what I've done is I've made some notes. I've made, I've made kind of pre-notes for me to be able to chat with you guys to try and speed this up a bit. I know that you guys don't want to give up your dinner time with your family, you don't want to give up your family time. And um, so I figured I'd try and make this as speedy as possible. In today's session, I'm gonna be covering four learning objectives. We're gonna describe particle theory. And can I just say that this is actually one of the poorest uh, answered questions that are commonly asked on GCSE exams. So we're gonna discuss those. Name state changes and symbols. And, say, uh, and then do heating and cooling curves. Most people have forgotten heating and cooling curves. They're rare. It's really nice to be able to uh, categorize questions by commonality. And I have, this one is definitely considered a rare question. Funnily enough, it reappears back in A level, in A2. It comes back to haunt you. Uh, and then I'm gonna be covering diffusion. And this is very common, V common. So this is really the one I need to be chatting about. States, states and particle theory are incredibly common as well. So this is common and this is common as well. So the rarity being the heating and cooling curves. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to do is, is show you the picture that you guys see all the time in terms of particle theory, are solids, liquids, and gases. <clears throat> um, Daniel's saying it that he hasn't eaten yet. Daniel, I think you should eat whilst having, uh, whilst eat whilst actually watching the webinar. I think that would be outstanding. Um, so, okay, we've got solids, liquids, gases. We all know these. Just to highlight key ones of these. So, the ones that they like to talk about most often are gases. Gases tend to make appearances more, partly due to the fact that it links into diffusion. Um, but if they ask you to draw them, the one that makes them the biggest appearance for drawing wise is our liquid. This is because liquids are done incredibly badly and it's not your fault. I, this is almost forgivable really. I'm gonna show you why. The reason being is if you Google particle theory, particle theory, solids, liquids, and gases, what you end up and you click on images, these are the pictures that you get. Um, if I actually do particle theory diagram, or states would do it, diagram, when I do that, 
So we get these kind of really standard pictures that everybody knows. And the problem is that, that so many of them for liquids are wrong. So if I just take this one as a prime example, uh, the liquid, the, the gas picture, I would consider to be correct. The solids one has problems, particles being spread out. They're not touching each other. And of course, the liquid is definitely not right. There's another classic. Got another picture there where the gas is correct. The liquid is absolutely wrong. And our solid is borderline, but actually still wrong. So the pic that's a good diagram. We've got our gases spaced out, our solids very closely packed, no gaps. But our liquid, again, no gaps. This is really important because it brings into one of these key properties that students get asked about often at exams, and that is this idea. And it's not included, of course, in this particular diagram in terms of properties-wise. This really wants to pick up properties well. And we like to say that solids have a fixed shape. We like to say that solids cannot be compressed, cannot be compressed. And often ask you to give an example. If I was off to, if, if I was asked to give an example, I'd quote an element. Or the one that I always like to teach is ice. Ice is a nice example of this. Next thing is, is the fluid diagram. Now, this fluid diagram that I happen to have here is it's not a bad effort. It has no regular arrangement. No regular, no regular arrangement. Arrangement and it doesn't show, it, it does have gaps, but you're allowed to have gaps in your diagram because if you disrupt the arrangement, that it inherently means that you're going to end up with gaps. They don't mind as long as all the particles are touching. What you cannot do for liquids, what you cannot do, here's your solid diagram, really straightforward with six particles. This is what you can't do. That is not okay. None of the particles are touching which means you will not gain any marks for this. Even though you'd lose your, you gain your mark for the, uh, the layers being disrupted and no arrangement, you will just simply lose the, part, lose the mask because the particles have gaps. This is not allowed. What I always say to students is, you should try drawing a V, and then you should try then going around the V with particles all the way around touching, and this allows you to give a really good diagram of a liquid where you have no regular arrangement because you've done a V to begin with, and then you've circled it, which means the arrangement's not there, but they will all be touching. So you will definitely get a mark for this. However, it's nice now to add in the diagrams to show that the particles are able to move around each other, but in any, any, any direction. So that is the picture of liquids I need you guys to be able to draw. Gases, of course, far apart, distributed, moving in random directions with random amounts of energy. We know that the ones that this solids have the lowest energy and they vibrate lowest energy. They vibrate around a fixed position. Always, I always like that's my diagram of choice. Liquids are medium energy. This is where I can just put it in as a capital A. So our medium energy, and of course these are the highest. And of course, we come across these in diagrams on every paper. It's part of paper one and it occurs regularly. So I need you guys to make sure that, that's, um, that you have a good routine. And the main one that I need you to focus on is being able to draw your liquids. Just to repeat the process for those people who've just joined, I've now got 16 watches. So if you draw a V in circles and then start at any point, it doesn't matter. And you go all the way around this as best you can, you will create a diagram with no regular arrangement and it will always give you that picture of a fluid that you need. Another thing to mention in terms of this is they often, of, they often ask you to draw these in boxes. If they do give you to ask them for boxes, then you should have your solid should be sitting on the bottom, uh, not floating in midair. Lots of people like to draw them. I, I didn't do my liquid too particularly well there. I'm going to redo my liquid, do it in the, the routine I know, draw a letter V. And students like, for some reason, to draw liquids floating in midair. Please don't do this. They are not, that is not correct. They should be sitting, if you draw your letter, if you draw your V, draw the first particle on the bottom and then draw your V, you can then go all the way around it, filling in the spaces, and then you'll get, and again, watch out for making sure there are no gaps. So do watch out for that. Uh, gases, of course, are spread out. They fill their space. 
Okay, so it's nice just to chat about solids, liquids, and gases. I'm going to use this diagram again because at this point we come across our state changes. Now, the key thing here is there are two that cause issues. Everyone knows the first one going from solid to liquid, and of course, this is our melting. The second, of course, is liquid to gas, and this one causes trouble because students, do we need to draw the arrows for the gas particle? Okay, Lucas, they won't penalize you for doing it, and you should, it's good, it's good practice. Because what they could ask you to do is to draw the diagram, including arrows to show the movement of the particles. But if they don't specify this, then you can draw the arrows anyway, and it's totally okay. So, next one, yes, really. Okay, so the next one is liquid to gas. Now, this one causes trouble. This arrow for me is a pain because students like to call it evaporating. Please don't. This is boiling. Because evaporating occurs at all temperatures. Any temperature below the, below the boiling point, it will still be occurring. Even ice has small, molecule, small molecules in, in water molecules leaving the surface and evaporating from the surface. Evaporating is the name given when a particle leaves a solid or a liquid and turns into a gas below boiling point. So do watch out for this. Boiling is the correct answer. The next one, of course, that they often ask is gas to liquid. This is condensing. Next. Condensing, by the way, uh, I get some really funny answers like liquefying. That, that, that's not okay. Condensing is the correct one. And then, of course, liquid to solid is freezing. So these common answers come up all the time and students do a poor job of it. The next one I'm going to mention is, of course, solid straight to gas. And this one, I'm sure most people remember because your chemistry teachers at any year when you're teaching this really, really emphasize this. This is a very unusual word and we don't see it very often. So they do like to ask it. And this word, of course, is sublimation. For those students who are really wanting to know all the detail, they never ask liquid to solid. That is because it does have a different name. If you go straight from a liquid to solid, it's called vapor deposition. Vapor deposition. Now, this is, I can actually tell you that this has never, ever made an appearance on, uh, on a GCSE paper, ever. But, of course, sublimation does. I also need to emphasize the need for knowing examples of these state changes. So I'm going to, I've made a re mess of these notes already because I'm going to be coming to my graph. So I'm going to erase, I'm going to erase that now and put it on a little bit more neatly. So we've got liquid to solid, gas to liquid, condensing, condensing, and we've got uh, freezing. And then this idea of sublimation. So key examples for this, I'm going to try and fit this into the gap. The key examples, examples of sublimation that you need to know, examples of sublimation, are iodine. This is by far the common, the most common um, question to be asked on, on, on sublimation. They will, they will ask you for an example. And iodine, which is a grey-black solid, a greyish solid, and iodine, so this is a grey-slash-black solid, and iodine, so, ooh, ooh, slide, nice one, solid. And iodine, when warmed, so when you warm this, it sublimes into a gas and, dis and turns straight away. So we go from iodine, and of course iodine is one of our diatomics. Ah, I'm not doing very well today. Iodine solid, jumping straight to iodine gas. And this, of course, is, and if you get purple, dark, Dark purple vapor. Dark purple vapor. Dark purple vapor. So iodine is the most common one. The next one, Johan, well done. And uh, Lucas, outstanding. I'm super impressed. The second example is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide can exist as what is known as dry ice. And it's called dry ice because it's never wet. Even if you put water onto it, that's cool purple gas. It, Lucas, it is a cool purple gas. It is, it's one of the few gases that has this really, really dark pronounced color. It's actually not, not a nice gas. It should always be done in a fume cupboard. It's nice for me at this point to pick up 
um, uh, precautions. Iodine is an oxidizing agent. It's also considered toxic in the form of a gas. So you would always use a fume cupboard. You can't wear goggles. You can't wear gloves. What you do is you use a fume cupboard. Because those purple vapor, that purple vapor is really, really nasty. If you breathe it in, it'll go through vapor deposition in your lungs and form crystalline solids in it. And then, of course, it'll oxidize your tissue. It's not nice. So dry ice, which is solid carbon dioxide, is constantly at room temperature. It is constantly turning into a vapor. And it turns into, of course, carbon dioxide gas. It skips the liquid phase. Does it take? Does it taste? Uh, take like the oxygen of hemoglobin? No, it doesn't. Iodine has nothing to do with oxygen or hemoglobin. Or hemoglobin. It is simply um, the fact that it'll start to oxidize your tissues. It'll start to react with it, and essentially burn them. It burns your cells. Symbol for an oxidizing agent, if anybody's curious. By the way, again, this is A-level. It's, it's an O with a flame coming off it. That's an oxidizing agent right there. It's not flammable. The symbol for flammable is just a straightforward flame. Um, I'm just going to quickly Google. Uh, it's quite nice to do. Uh, just going to, if I can, there we go. Go back to this. I'm just going to um, Google hazard symbols. If I do hazard symbols, hazard symbols occur at GCSE quite frequently. So there we go. So we've got flammable, which is this solid line with a flame on top, but then the oxidizing agent, which is this O with a flame coming off the top. So iodine would be toxic and oxidizing. And of course, it would always be handled in a fume cupboard. Now, just to mention that there is a practical with iodine, which actually comes, uh, that includes vapor deposition, which if you do, uh, and this is, a, this is called an iodine finger experiment, and I'll Google picture, and what I will get is this. So there it is. So iodine here, is, again, you get to see, all, to see the two states, and it's a rather beautiful demonstration. I have an outer boiling tube, now, do remember that boiling tubes are not the same as test tubes. Test tubes are the skinny ones. Boiling tubes are the large ones, and they're designed to be heated. They're made of a different type of glass, which is called Pyrex, rather than test tubes, which are made of soda glass. But the iodine is the black solid at the bottom. They've warmed it, and it's turned into the purple vapor, which you can see. And you can see a beautiful example of diffusion here. It's dark purple at the top and a pale purple at the uh, Sorry, dark purple at the bottom and a pale purple at the top. And you can see these black crystals forming on the cold test tube. The test tube is filled with ice. This is to promote, I always thought that the symbol was uh, someone's head on fire. That's really funny. Um, so the ice is there to cool the iodine vapor and cause it to crystallize back into a solid. So that's vapor. So we've got, we've got um, a sublimation occurring at the bottom of the test tube and you have vapor de deposition occurring on the top chapter test tube. They ne in the GCSE exam where this appeared, they did not ask for the words vapor deposition. They simply asked you to explain, to, to give the name of the process that iodine was going on at the bottom of the boiling tube, which is sublimation. And then you had to explain why the, the test tube inside was cold, it had, it had ice cubes in it. And all you had to say was it was to lower the temperature in order to promote the gaseous iodine to turn back into its solid. That was all you need to do was just a description of it. The next thing, of course, is I do just want to mention this idea of descriptions because my first learn, my first learning objective, uh, learning objective was to be able to describe these particles. Why is iodine solution orangey? Ah, oh, Lucas, that's a really, really difficult question. Colors are really complicated. It's actually because the iodine is actually forming very, very, very small clusters of molecules. They're on the nano scale, in which case you get a different color when it's in solution. When it's in gas, you've got very large particles grouping together, which give you a, a purpley gas. And then the solid is even larger structures of molecules, hence why it goes so dark. But then in the, in the water, they're spread out in much smaller units, which means you see an alternative color. This is also seen in other elements, such as gold. Gold is, of course, everyone knows is yellow. But when you put it into nanoparticles, it turns red. This is how the old artisans used to make gold. Uh, so I used to make red stained glass. You'd add gold and it would form nanoparticles which reflected, absorbed blue and reflected red. So it had a different color. 
Um, but color's complicated. But the next thing for me to mention is this idea of descriptions. So you do need to be able to describe these. And this, and I put it over here, this idea of regular arrangements, and they're up there, close together, regular arrangement, close together, random arrangement, are able to move over each other, gas, far apart, random, moving quickly in all directions. So the descriptions are there, and they, they, they really do like to ask about it. Okay, my next thing, we've done, we've, we've done describing particle theory. We've looked at the diagrams. I can add in diagrams at this point. Describe particle theory, brackets, diagrams, and drawing. We have then also done name state changes and to give state symbols. Now, okay, I rushed through the state symbols. Uh, I do just want to, to, to mention these. We know that there are four commonly used state symbols in chemistry. We have got a state symbol of a solid, we've got a state symbol of liquid, we have a state symbol of gas, and we also have a state symbol of aqueous. And I just want, I just want to make sure that everyone's okay with the aqueous. Aqueous means dissolved in water in H2O. That's what that means. And of course, if you ever want to spell it, aqueous, it's a horrible word, aqueous. Uh, you'll never come across it in terms of dissolved in any other type of solvent. Uh, and even if it is dissolved in a, in a different solvent, you tend to call it aqueous anyway. But it is tricky, that one. It never gets asked, not even at A level. Okay, um, next. Okay, at this point, I drop into my heating and cooling curves. And I think this is probably, um, it's probably the bit that you guys will have the least memory of. You haven't seen these since year seven and eight. I've just done, I've just redone it with my year nines. And all of them, all of them remember seeing it. Every single one, when I asked the class to raise their hands on people who didn't recognize that there wasn't a single hand. So every single one of them recognized these graphs. And these are the graphs that we see. And what they like to do is they like to take these graphs. Uh, now, you can, of course, in the GCSE, you can be asked to plot them. That does happen. Plot the graph. But if you're asked to plot it, you will usually only be given a small section of it. It's very rare to see a plot graph going all the way from solids right up to gases. Um, what you're much more likely to get is to label the graph. So in terms of labeling, it's really straightforward. So this here, this particular one, this is a heating graph. And of course, this makes total sense because we can see that the temperature here is rising. This is not complicated. We can see the temperature is moving up as we work through it. So we're going to be taking a solid. Now, when you take a solid and you heat it, the temperature of the solid will increase. So what I can draw here is I've got my solid particles here. And at this point on the graph, they're moving very slowly. And then as I warm up the solid, they will gain energy. So at this point on the graph, note I am not actually at the transition point. So at this point, the particles will simply be in exactly the same arrangement, but their vibration has now increased. So we would obviously say to them that during this heating process, they gain energy and they will vibrate more quickly. That's it. They also, of course, as a consequence of this, they will expand. And this question of explain why solids expand when, sorry, yeah, solids expand when heated. You simply need to describe the particles. They're gaining energy, they're vibrating more, so therefore they're going to expand. The two marks are for gain energy and increase in vibration. This vibration causes them to bounce off each other and the solid grows. At this point, we now see the transition. And at this point, all of a sudden, now this is, this is a fascinating part of chemistry because the graph stops rising. Now, this is very odd because you haven't, and I need to stress this here, 11, you have not stopped heating it. The temperature is still, that Bunsen burner never left this solid. So I've got my Bunsen burner, I'm heating the solid, and I'm still heating the solid, but the temperature now no longer rises. And the reason for this is because the energy we are now going through melting, and the energy, energy, is being is being used up being used up to and i emphasize this year 11 to weaken the bonds 
it doesn't break them. Now, can I say at GCSE, they don't care. You're even allowed to say break them. And it annoys me, but you shouldn't. It's better chemistry for you to realize that in a solid going to a liquid, the bonds aren't broken. They're weakened substantially to the point where the molecules are now able to move over each other. I remember a balloon I held over a fire when I was five from the... Exp oh. Thanks, Lucas. Okay. We continue to heat it, and we now get another transition point. So at this point, I can use uh, my phenolphthalein color there, an alkali, uh, bright pink. And at this point, we now enter the liquid phase. So the key thing of this graph is simply to understand that the states are on the rising, um, the rising part of the graph with a nice linear, linear uh, gradient. And the state changes are at the horizontals. So where does the energy go? Ah, oh, Johan, the energy is being used in breaking them. We know that mexobendo. I love this. It's one of my favorite ever. I didn't even invent it. Very frustrating. Shout out to my A-level student who invented this. Um, we've got mexobendo. And this is just an easy way of remembering that making bonds. Ah, making bonds. Making bonds. I'm going to put bonds at the end. Is exothermic. Exothermic. Breaking bonds. Breaking bonds is endothermic. Endothermic. So, Johan, you asked a really lovely question there. Mexto bendo, yo. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Johan, you asked where the energy is going. The energy is being converted. It's going from heat energy and actually going into chemical energy. It's being used to break the molecules. And the energy is then, once those bonds are now weakened, the molecules are then going to gain it. It's going to be going through thermal decomposition. And thermal decomposition is an example of an endothermic process. Do the par particles actually expand bigger or just the space? Oh my God, Tiffany, the particles do not get bigger. It is just the space between them. The particles do not grow. They're just vibrating more. Yeah. So it's nice. To, so the energy is actually being used up to weaken them. Next one. Yeah, particles don't expand. That is correct. Particles are particles. They remain the same. So at this point, all of a sudden, we see the same phenolphthalein changeover, and we get to see a change in state occur. And this is now boiling, not evaporating. And then final transition. When does the temperature start to rise again? By the way, if you're wondering in this one that the energy now, I'm going to now move this. This is where I'm, I'm starting to get the hang of this tablet a little bit. So at this point, the energy, why does it stop rising? The energy is being used up to break, is being used up breaking bonds. Okay, breaking bonds. So again, temperature stops rising because the energy is being used rather than going into vibrational energy, which is what temperature measures. It's being used in breaking them so the temperature remains the same. And then, of course, we end up at our final state. We end up at our final state, which is gas. So, and at that point, we're done. So I've just done a heating graph. I did also want to show you this one straight out of a GCSE paper. And they gave, this time, they flipped it because they know that teachers have a really, really bad habit. And you know what, guys? I am as guilty as the next chemist. It's very easy to teach heating curves, heating graphs, uh, and totally forget about cooling graphs. Because, of course, it does exactly the same process. But this time, we're going to cool it down. We start up here. This is where I can actually put it onto the GCSE. Here is a gas. Here, right. The state's the opposite. In, the state changes opposite. Instead of boiling, this is now condensing. Clever changeover. Now it drops into being a liquid. Then, of course, it drops into freezing rather than melting. And then we're into our solid. It's a lovely question. They often offer three marks for it. That's a three-mark question straight out of a GCSE exam. 
And people often ask, where do the three marks come from? You get all five correct for three, and every one you get wrong, you lose one. So if you get two out of five, you get absolutely nothing. So do be aware of that. A container of gas has been placed in the freezer, and a scientist measures the temperature after 10 minutes. Label the graph with the connect correct scientific processes. Describe what is happening at each stage. So, uh, uh, so what's happening in terms of the gases? The gas particles are losing energy. So on this section of the graph, going to do that in, in phenol, phthalene, pink, alkali. So the particles are slowing down. They're losing energy, losing energy, losing energy, slowing down. That's, that's okay for you to say. Slow down. Slow down. Um, uh, I think that's all you need to say at that point. Condensing. Bonds are now forming. So bonds between the molecules. Would you be able to show vapor deposition and sublimation on a heating curve? That's a really good question. Yes, you would. God, I've never... Who asked me that? Is boiling and condensing point the same when take, talking about temperature? Yes, they are. There is, there's only two temperatures you ever talk about. This is called the thermometer line, Lucas. Whenever you do the thermometer line... You have two state changes, two important temperatures. This here is the MPT, otherwise known as melting point. But, it and let's call this, let's give it a number. Let's go for water, zero degrees Celsius. That is also the freezing point. They are the same temperature. That's a crossover point. If you're actually going to hold something at that temperature, oh, year 11, you're not going to like this, at that exact temperature, it is an equilibrium. Both, no, both freezing and melting will be occurring simultaneously. Just to actually, oh yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. So at that time, there was only one temperature. So at the same thing, let's go for water. Boiling point, everyone here. I'm going to put boiling. Uh, oh, didn't make it. I'm gonna, let's try that again. Boiling point. Boiling P, melting P. And we know that this is 100 degrees Celsius for water. And this is also the condensing point. Same temperature, no difference. Condensing point, no change in temperature. This is one point. So two crossovers below the melting point. I always draw this for the year nines. Solid, liquid, and gas. It's a really easy way. I'm going to just drop into another GCSE question at this point, which is question for this one, which it says, <clears throat> substance X. Substance X um, has the following. This is me writing GCSE questions, but it is, it, it is, this is just one that happens to come to mind. Substance X has the following um, properties. Has the following properties. So it says X, and then on the little table, it says melting point minus 25 degrees C, and then it says boiling point. By the way, just so you know, uh, Julie, um, I haven't forgotten about your sublimation question. I'll come to it. Boiling point, 65 Celsius. Question A, what is state of X at 43 degrees Celsius? So what you do is you draw yourself a thermometer line through the data. You mark on your two numbers, 65, 25. You look where 43 is, 43 is going to slot in in the middle. That's a solid, that's a liquid, and that's a gas. It's a really easy mesh method, and it works really well. Students like that. It is, it's, it's one of those methods that I seem to have latched onto as a chemistry teacher. Okay, so Julie, your question regarding state. Oh, by the way, Julie, I've never seen one. Isn't that, you've asked me a question I've never been asked. They're so rare, and I really like it. Well done. But... If you were going to go through sublimation, then you'd be, as a solid, you'd be heating it. You'd be heating your solid, and then all of a sudden, you would get exactly the same thing. It would level out, and then it would go straight up. But what they would clearly make out here is that there's only one step. Now, just to explain why iodine does this. This does come in to GCSE. That would be sublimation. I've never seen them do it, ever. 
never even crossed my mind, but it would be a single state change. The reason being is the temperature would stop rising once again, but this time the description would be instead of going from solid to liquid and it weakening bonds, the energy used up, used to break. You'd go drop straight into breaking to break bees. Just to, oh, I've just had something else in my head and it's just, oh, just to explain why iodine sublimes. Iodine is a cool substance because it's simple covalent. Or, by the way, properly known as just covalent. Now, iodine makes little molecules of I2. And they are, there are weak intermolecular forces between the molecules. Now, these molecules, of course, those weak intermolecular forces are very, very weak. So even the smallest amount of energy is going to break these WIMPs. When I like, I, I invented, I've never heard anyone else call this, I, I invented this, the WIMPH, which is weak intermolecular molecular forces. Now, just to tell you what that means, weak, of course, well, that's self-explanatory. And then inter means between. Between molecular just simply means molecules. Weak between molecules forces. And these are incredibly weak. And so a small amount of heat will mean that it skips. Absolutely, Donna, I need to copyright WIMF. You're absolutely right. Same thing with carbon dioxide. The WIMFs are very weak. So a small amount of heat and it changes. Right, once again, now, uh, what I then did, I then, oh, I had to, I had to really dig for this question, folks. This is not, this question was not from Edexcel. I couldn't find one on Edexcel, but I found this on AQA. They gave this graph, and the questions were very straightforward. The questions won, and by the way, those people on the chat, I've got 16 people watching. I love this. So question number one, what temperature, what temp, what temperature did X melt at? Or I shouldn't say melt, I should say, what is the melting point of X? Would anybody, who's going to post on the classroom, on the, it's not classroom, on the chat first? Who's going to get it? I'll give a commendation out on live on YouTube. Come on, folks. Who's going to give it to me? Donna! Do you know what? Well done, Donna. Great job. Let's just check. Let's check she's right. See if she scores her. I'll give you... Donna, if you've got it right. Oh, that's awesome. I've just got 55, 55, and 50. Wei uh, Shan, you might have just read it wrong. Let's just check. We're going from 30 to 60. Oh, I've just overlapped onto my grid, and I don't want to. So 60 and 30, right, I need to go upwards to here. So this one, this one here is gonna be right in the middle. This is going to be 45. So this one's gonna be 35. This one's going to be 40, 45, 50, 55 and 60. And by the way, everyone in this, everyone who's watching this live right now knows that, or at least the ones in my class this week, today, knows that I read a graph wrong. So uh, not a graph, maybe it was a piece of equipment. So it happens to the best of us, folks. But if I now plot my line across, the melting point is 55 degrees C. The answer was 55. Well done for those people. Great job. Just check our units. 55 degrees Celsius. Okay, U11, what's the boiling point? Commendation up for grabs. Who's going to get it? Who's gonna get it? Come on. I'm waiting for the chat to appear. What is the boiling point? Tenzi, well done. Dead easy, great job. Follow it across. Using, in your exam, you're gonna use a ruler to show this. Don't try and do this freehand because boys, you'll do that. I don't know how you do it, but you do. I would swear, but no. <laughs> so we've got, we follow that line all the way across. Yeah, my tablet's struggling. 
and it's at 90. So the questions were lovely, really easy. So then, so I'm going to put what temp, and I'll just put BPT, boiling point. And the answer is absolutely spot on 90 degrees Celsius. Donna, Tenzi, I will give you three commendations each there. Outstanding. Well done. 115 is a gas, right? Absolutely. We've got solid, melting, melty, followed by liquid, followed by boily. But, but it, that, that's not a real thing. It's just me getting overexcited over chemistry. So melting, boiling. Yeah, and well done. Absolutely. Um, who asked? Amira, 115 would definitely be a gas. Absolutely. I love it. Cool. Great, guys, well done for that. There's one more question that followed this. So I think everyone in this, everyone who's watching this YouTube video right now is thinking, I can do that. So, okay, question number three. Here it is. How, how do you know, how do you know that X is not... And they underlined it, they put it in bold, is not water. That was the last question. And it was two marks. And students found this really difficult. It was, I don't think they found it really difficult. I'll tell a lie. Not really difficult. It was just they'd never seen it before. Amira, outstanding, well done. Uh, although you've just put the melting point is not 100. You've just lost it. Shouldn't be melting point. Should be bo boiling. Johan. No. Oh, is greater. Boiling point 100, which is greater than 90. Yes. Johan, see what you've done there. Well done. I had answered that question for you in class. Well done. Good job. And yes, guys, do you know what? Here's the nightmare. What you have to say to get those two marks. You had to say the boiling point, I'll put answer, boiling point or melting, you could use either number. You had to quote water and the graph. You had to do a comparison for the two marks. Water, answer, water, water, boiling point, BPT, is 100 degrees Celsius. X was 90. Now, guys, this lends me, this walks me into the next question. Now, I found this one. Oh, God, did I keep it? I might have kept it. I did! Guys, I kept this question because I came across it on the Edexcel and I absolutely fell in love with it. Because how do you make a topic that everyone did in year nine that is an absolute doddle? Yes, I used the word doddle. Yeah, An absolute walk in the park. How do you make it hard? You show them something they have never seen before, ever. Not in class, not in papers. And I need you guys to not, don't freak out. So, why is the stirrer shaped like that? That's a really good question. The reason being is because the the sample tube. Ooh, ooh. Uh, I can, I, I can, I can do. Look at this. I can write on it. Ha ha. This is called a sample tube. They've labelled it as a small tube. Its proper name. That's rubbish. The name is called a sample tube, or even better is called a capillary, capillary tube. A capillary tube, by the way, is incredibly thin. It's really, really skinny, super skinny. And a tubal, oh my goodness, Mr. Duncan, what is going on with you today? I just spelled tube as tubal. Capillary tube, I think it's a double L. Capillary tube, sample tube or capillary tube. It's really, really skinny. It needs to say, oh damn, that, that thing's in biology. It's nothing to do with the semi-permeable membrane, by the way. Uh, spoon. So anyway, this capillary tube, which is super skinny, and the skinnier the better, because it means that the, the solid is going to get 
evenly heated. If you've got a big sample in a wide tube, it's going to be, you're going to see the edges melt before the center, which makes it difficult to see it melt, to decide on a melting point. You need to see this go boom and suddenly liquefy. You need it to be an instantaneous transfer to be able to get a good solid reading on its melting point. So you put it in in a really super skinny tube. Now what you do is you have to put that in the middle right next. Please note the thermometer is right next door. And the reason for this, guys, is because if that we know that water is going to be hot at the bottom and cool and warm and cooler at the top. The heat has got to spread out through the mixture, which means that the thermometer, no matter the best stirring that we could do, no matter what you can do with that, that crazy shaped stirring rod, you're still going to end up with a gradient in terms of temperature wise. So what that means is we need to ensure that the thermometer is sitting right next door to that capillary tube so that we know when that solid turns into a liquid, we can take that reading and that reading is going to be the temperature right next door to the capillary tube. If you put the thermometer too low, it'll be too high. If you put it higher, it'll be too low. The reason why the stirring rod is the shape that it is, is because we need to be able to stir underneath this. And it's going to be difficult because the stirring rod is going to be obscured by the thermometer and the capillary tube. So we need to get other, be able to get underneath it, stir it really thoroughly so they have this really big, bizarre loop on it. It's rather odd, though, isn't it? Name the apparatus labelled P. That's really funny because I've cut off the label P. That's brilliant. So P is the thermometer. I think everyone's thinking, yeah, that's, that, that's easy. No worries. Next, solid Q melts at 140 degrees. Explain why water is not a suitable liquid for use in this experiment. We want to find out the temperature that the solid Q melts at. Well, if we know roughly what that number is, and that's about 140, we realize that we cannot use water. The reason being is water will not reach 140 degrees Celsius. The temperature will level off. The only thing that gets above 100 degrees is steam, which is gaseous or gaseous water, water vapor, steam, they're the same thing. So you cannot get water above 100, it's certainly not at atmospheric pressure. So explain why water is not a suitable liquid, because you cannot reach 140 degrees Celsius with water. Suggest a fluid, suggest a liquid that could, oh, suggest why the liquid in the beaker needs to be stirred constantly, because otherwise the water at the bottom of the beaker will be hot and the water at the top of the beaker is going to be cooler. You can't say cold, it's, not, it's gonna be at a lower temperature, which means, we're not going to be able to, to get a nice solid um, A changeover in terms of melt. You're not going to see the solid just suddenly liquefy. And we're also not going to be able to get a good reading on the temperature of the water at the point at which it melts. Now, the next question. Okay, guys, impress me, year 11. Suggest a liquid that could be used that's not water. Mr. Duncan, can you scroll to the top of the page again, please? What? Here's my question to you, Year 11. I will give out three commendations. Johan, nailed it. Well done. Good job, guys. Really pleased. Oil. Can I also say, okay, I'm going to give Johan, you score the three commendations. Amira, you've got another chance. Oil isn't enough. What type of oil would you use? Now consider safety. Oh, who's going to get it? Who's going to get it? I'll say it again, year 11. Be specific. What oil? No, Donna! I knew someone was going to do that. Amira, recommendations. Well done. Outstanding. Well done. Amira, you're right. It's vegetable oil. Well done. Okay, did you say canola oil? Oh, diesel? Kenzie, you're going to set fire to the whole place. Oh, my goodness. The answer is vegetable oil. By the way, Dana, they will also... Yeah, you got it, Amira. Dana, they will also accept sunflower oil. They, I, they really won't accept diesel. I have no idea what canola oil is, so I'm going to not. I'm, I'm going to say maybe. Don't know. <laughs> well done, Amira. Um, Miss Donna, can you ask? Can, you, can I ask a favour? Can you quickly make a note of the students that I owe commendations to? I owe Johan accommodation three accommodations. I owe Amira three accommodations. I owe Donna. 
three accommodations, and I think I owe Tensi three accommodations. I, I, I'm not, uh, I think, Eek, not sure. Um, I think so. Who was it? Yeah, Tensi, well done, guys. Thank you so much. Lucas just said perfume in Malay. I'm, oh, perfume is not an oil. Good grief. Although it is in a different liquid. It's in pure alcohol. It's quite cool. Anyway, Dana, Johan, Tenzi, and Amira all get three accommodations tomorrow. Well done, Year 11. Chuffed a bit with that. You did really, really well. So you can see, guys, they're going to put you into these bizarre settings, which is why this webinar is worthwhile doing. Okay, let's go back to my, my, my bits and pieces. So we have covered now. We have now covered the heating and cooling curves. And I've also included this idea of we can now do melting points as well. Uh, I'm going to drop one more. I'm going to add a little bit of extra notes here. As, as a consequence of heating and cooling, we covered melting point apparatus, which is, I mean, an absolute meal of that. Melting point apparatus, apparatus. Uh, which was that previous question, the idea that we can find and work out the melting point of something by taking a sample in a capillary tube, putting it into a liquid that can go above its melting point and warming it up, and then taking the reading as soon as it melts. Uh, they like this idea of why do you need to heat it? Why do you need to stir it to get uh, nice even heating throughout the fluid? All that jazz. Guys, I'm also going to now mention one more thing on the notes. Purity. Okay. Guys, this is something you can add into your notes if you're making any, and that is that we can test the purity. And the way that you do that is with a melting point or boiling point. Everyone here knows that when you cook pasta and you pour the water in the pan, that water boils at 100, but you add salt. Now, people think that the salt is being added for flavor. This is not true. Purity. We add salt to water. Add salt to water. Add salt to water um, when cooking pasta. When cooking pasta. The reason, the question is why. The reason, answer, the salt, the NaCl, will raise the melting, the, the boiling point. It will raise the boiling point, the BPT of the water. So instead of boiling, instead of that water sitting, no, Johan, it doesn't reduce it. It increases it. it yeah. It, yes, it, it does also. <laughs> It will raise the boiling point. Now, what that means is the pasta is at a higher temperature. Pasta in H2O at higher temp, therefore, will cook faster. And guess what topic I just dropped into? Okay, year 11. 13 watches, another chance for three accommodations. Why does the higher temperature cook the pasta quicker? I will wait for the response. I'm loving this, guys. I've never done a question and answer session during this. This is lovely. So why does it answer? Why does it cook faster? Dana, you're nearly there. You've got the first one. Come on, Dana. Oh, wow. I love the fact that you guys are giving me, like, really cool chemistry here. Your addition of ions. Uh, Keon, the addition of ions means that you're adding in full charged particles, which means is why it binds it together better, which is why it's harder to break the bonds in a higher temperature is needed. But what I'm wanting for, guys, is why does pasta cook quicker? This is answer. This is rates of reaction. And we are going to run kick ass right knowledge particles particles have more energy collisions there are more frequent collisions 
more particles, more parts, particles have activation energy. There are more successful collisions. We drop straight into rates in a, in a heating and boiling curve. Isn't that cool? Tenzi, what does KICKASS stand for? KICKASS is an acronym that I use for teaching rates, Kenzi, uh, Tenzi. So the, the K stands for knowledge. So in this case, particles with higher energy. C stands for collision frequency. So in this case, there is a higher collision frequency. A stands for activation energy. There are more particles that have it. And S stands for successful, the number of successful collisions. Thanks, Dana, for helping out there. Great knowledge, great notes there. Great job, great, great knowledge, Dana. Well done. Okay, so I am done with my heating and cooling curves. We are on to the last one, folks which is diffusion. And we are so far still got 14 watches. I think the video has been going on just under an hour. We're nearly done, or at least for the thing. I've done loads of example questions, but I'm going to be quick with the diffusion. I'm going to be really quick. So what I've done is I've taken a photograph of various diffusion demonstrations that are often done with, um, uh, Donna, did you get three accommodations for that? Uh, you didn't go all the way, Donna. You've got to go full kick-ass on that. You've got to go knowledge, collisions, activation, energy. I'll give you a one. <laughs> okay, three demonstrations for diffusion. Number one, we've got our good old potassium permanganate, our dark solid. So this is, we add a black solid to this. And the first thing that's happening at this point, I'm going to use my phenolphthalein color again. So we have dissolving. The solid dissolves. And by the way, in terms of particles theory, we've got the, the water molecules colliding, pulling them apart. We then have, at this point, once it's completely dissolved, and this is the point here, that now has completely dissolved. The reason, and how would you know this? There is no solid remaining. It has completely vanished. So the dissolving process has disappeared, but the diffusion process is now starting to take place. Now, what happens is in diffusion, we know that we move from an area of high content. You really can't read that. Let's see if I can make this easier to read. What goes opposite to purple, yellow? We do high con an area, an area of high concentration, and the particles will now spread out, spread out to an area of low concentration. Now. At this point, people think it's all over, and it's not. Because what they now do is ask you for this car. And this picture is such a beautiful picture that I found on the internet. Because when, here's the next question. When does diffusion stop? When does diffusion stop? And the answer, I've noticed my capitalization there. When the particles i'm dropping back into yellow when answer when the particles are particles are evenly distributed distributed distrib dis distributed and the particles are evenly distributed they love that question that question seems to be arising more often than the actual diffusion question itself, which I think is fascinating. The next one, two gases. So we now have bromine versus nitrogen dioxide. Now I did this in the video. If you haven't had time to watch the video, you can now, you can go back and watch that later. Yes, I've done it. The video is on there, it's on my channel. So I have two gases and both these gases, both these gases are brown. Both brown gases now what that means is it's a real both brown gases this means that they're great to compare because if you have a sim notice the picture they have similar concentrations what observation means that you know that they have similar similar concentrations they have a similar color and darkness so due to the fact they're similar and about if we're going to compare them they need to be yeah, similar shade, sorry, thank you. There is similar shade, which suggests similar concentrations. So I've got two gases, and what they're going to do is we know that the gases are going to diffuse up the tube. 
Notice he's removing, he's got an empty bottle and a, and, a, and a full bottle. He's removing the divide. There's a piece of glass here that divide, divides them. He's removing this and the gases are going to diffuse up. And what they love to do in here is to compare the two. I've got bromine gas. Bromine on the periodic table is 80 and, and uh -oh, 30. Uh, five? Oh, no. I've forgotten my atomic number. I'm going to go and check. I, I, can't, I can't. Guys, I have to do it. it kick, yes. Love it. So bromine 80 and 35. But remember, I've made a mistake there. Look at that. Bromine. But bromine, remember, travels around in pairs. What that means is its MR is 160. That is one heavy gas. <laughs> like the state symbol. Love that. Okay, next one. We've got nitrogen dioxide, another brown gas. This time, nitrogen at 14 plus oxygen at 16 times by 2. So 16 times 2 is 32 plus 14 is 30, uh, 46. My terrible maths there. 46. Guys, look at the comparative weights. Yeah. The bromine, we can actually give it a number almost. You know, it is... It is four, nearly four times heavier. What that means is the bromine gas is going to diffuse more slowly. So at the end of that picture, what's going to be seen, I should never draw three-dimensional diagrams. It's not done in chemistry. We have two tubes and the bromine, the brown of bromine will have gone like this. Yeah, but the NO2, will have spread out much further. So the bromine is much heavier, therefore it's going to diffuse more slowly. And so we're going to get these two different colors. Next, we then drop, we leave our diffusion of, and we get into the main culprit. Guys, we all know this one. We've seen it on the document, however many times. I'm realizing that the time is 8.02. I'm so sorry, folks, that this is taking longer than I thought it would. Who would thought that states is going to take so long? So I now have this glass tube and they love doing this idea of ammonia versus HCl. Just a warning, ammonia is a gas of NH3 formula, and hide, this is not, not, and I emphasize this, the gas in the tube is not hydrochloric acid. This is hydrogen chloride gas, hydrogen chloride gas, but what we soak the cotton wool in is concentrated hydrochloric acid, HCl, acid. So there's a difference. If it's, if it's a gas, it's hydro hydrogen chloride. If it's a solution, it's, it's hydrochloric acid. Is that Mr. Duncan? Uh, okay, next. So we now get to look at the distances traveled. And this is actually a, a, one of the really, a, a, again, really poorly answered. They will say, using your knowledge of the molecules, question. Using your knowledge, your know-how. Using your know-how. I, I don't like that. I prefer knowledge. <laughs> using your knowledge, explain. Explain the, the white smoke. White smoke's position. So the, 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 the ring forms, the ring forms, if this is ammonia and this is HCl, the ring forms, if I divide this into four quarters, duh, 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 in fact, five, where would I put that? It is definitely not in the middle. It is, ammonia has an MR of 17. Nitrogen is 14 plus H. We at one times by three gives us an MR of 17, very light gas. And hydrochloric acid is H, which is one, and Cl, which is 35.5, MR 36.5. So what's going to happen is the ammonia is going to travel further. It's not going to be super close to HCl, but it's going to be somewhere in the gap. So you're just expected to be able to roughly point where it is. So, and then they're going to ask you to explain why, and you quote the MRs. MRs, and then you say that the ammonia will travel 
will travel further, further than HCL in the same, in the same amount of time. Key thing, distance traveled, amount of time. So do watch out. That brings us to the end, year 11 of our crash course. Right, I'm gonna be super quick now, guys. So let's go through our quick preliminary booklet. What is the name of the movement of the two gases? Diffusion. Which gas is moving faster and give a reason for your choice? Right, the ammonia. Oh, guys, exam technique. If they give you a diagram, and it includes numbers. You must quote them. Watch out. I've just lost it. I've just lost, well, probably. I'd probably lost that one. Identify which gas is moving faster, give a reason. Ammonia is moving faster. It has traveled further, brackets, 60 centimeters, than HCL, brackets, 40 centimeters in the same time. Always quote your data. Next. The experiment was repeated at a higher temperature. Explain how the change would affect the time taken for the ring to form. Number one, the position of the ring will be, uh, I lost loads of marks for not using quotes in literature. Yeah, you've got in, in chemistry, if you see numbers, you must quote them. So it would not change the, the position of the smoke. It will form in exactly the same place. However, it will decrease the time. Do not say increases the rate. No, no, no. They've asked you about the time the time will decrease. The particles have more energy. The particles, therefore, will be moving more rapidly. Therefore, the particles will move more quickly. The time taken for the particles to travel the required distance is less. Moving on. Gas particles move at a speed of several hundred meters per second at room temperature. So just one reason why it took five minutes for the white ring to form. Guys, list principle. If asked you for one reason, you just need to quote one reason. If you quote more, they'll just ignore it. The particles are moving randomly. There's, I've just gained my one mark. That's all I needed to say. I've done it. Particles collide. Now, I've given all the answers because I wanted, I hate giving one answer. I think the explanation of all of them is good. Just close it up. So the particles move randomly. One mark. The particles collide with air molecules. One mark. They also collide with the walls of the chamber. Half the time, they're going to be moving backwards. They're moving randomly. So it takes them longer to reach there than you probably expect, given the actual speed of the particles. Any one of those answers is going to get you the mark. What if I said they meet each other faster? No, Lucas, lose it. It's nothing to do with time. Done. D thank you, Lucas. I needed someone to ask that. You must mention one reason why it took five minutes for the ring. Oh, hang on. You're talking about this one. You must have mentioned the time. Yeah, you must. It's nothing to do with faster, slow, faster, slow. It doesn't even exist in chemistry. It's higher rate or, or, or lower rate. You should never say the word speed or faster in chemistry. Next. Right, guys, we dropped into chemical tests. Positive ion, ammonium. Negative ion, chloride ions. Got to know these. Give the chemical test for the ammonium ion. Just, guys, you can't make this stuff up. You've just got to know them. Add sodium hydroxide and warm it. Use damp red litmus paper to test for ammonia gas and the damp red litmus paper will turn blue. Now I've written the equation for this. The sodium hydroxide that you added removes a proton. It acts as a base, which of course it would do as an alkali. And it removes the extra H on the ammonium. So this is acting as an acid. And then I form water and we get back our ammonia gas, which is we test for that with damp red litmus paper, and it turns blue. The alternative test, alternative test for the ammonia gas, not for ammonium ion, that is the only answer, but the test for ammonia gas is you can also put conch HCl nearby, and you will get white misty smoke, which is what this is doing. Nice to talk about that. Next. Let's try and speed up. Describe a chemical test to show that the substances contain chloride ions. They've repeated it. So, oh, but this time they've done ammonium, they're under chloride. Dilute nitric acid removes the carbonate ions. And look, I've given an equation for that. The H plus is in the acid. This is acid. 
the acid reacts with the carbonate ions and rips an O off. That turns into water and I'm left with carbon dioxide gas, which bubbles away. Hence, removing impurity, removing the carbonate ions, followed by silver nitrate solution, a white precipitate forms. And here is my ionic equation. Ag1 plus plus Cl minus goes to AgCl. They love this. They love it. Love this. This comes up like the ionic equation for the formation of the precipitate. They love it. The what does the, the reversible reaction? Not even a bother. Name the white solid ammonium chloride. What does the diagram show about the speeds? Ammonia molecules have a higher speed compared to the HCl because they've traveled further in the same given time. What is the precaution for acids? Hazard, they are, HCl is corrosive. And that precaution is wear gloves. Do not put goggles. Gloves is the right answer. You saw me doing that in the video. Wear gloves. Next. Ooh. So it says, teacher, yada, 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 gas form, reaction between it. On the diagram shows where the white, what process has occurs for the gas molecules to move across? Diffusion. Explain how the diagram shows which gas moves more quickly. Ammonia has traveled. You will see the repeat on these questions. I said burns. Lucas, no. Burns is fire. That's heat. That's melting of skin. It's not, it's not corrosive. Corrosive means that it, it is technically, it is actually, oh, the H plus is going to be, oh, the acid will be stripping you of electrons forming your cells to form compounds which are soluble and technically you dissolve in your own fluids. It's nasty. But anyway, you cannot say burn. You cannot. That's heat. Acids corrode. They're corrosive. Ice, it's, it's, I saw acid burns on BBC Bite Size. Yes, Lucas, the internet is a great resource, but it's also full of garbage chemistry. And that's one of them. Next, identify the so. The teacher tested for the ammonium chloride solution. She used the added solution X. She warmed it. Gas given off. Damp litmus. Name solution X. Sodium hydroxide. Gas given off. Ammonia. Ammonia. Not ammonium. Ammonia gas. Final color of the litmus paper would be blue because it's, it's an alkali. pH 11. Good to know. Next, why did she add the nitric acid? She had the nitric acid to remove carbonate ions, or you're also allowed to say to remove impurities. But I prefer carbonate ions as better chemistry. Suggest the identity of solution Y, silver nitrate, the white precipitate, silver chloride. Question number four, give the name of the apparatus. I'm sure everyone felt this was like a bit, I was like, oh my goodness, thank goodness, a nice easy question. Stirring rod for X, Bunsen burner for Y. Just to go a little bit further, this bit here, other questions that sometimes students are tripped up by. That is a gauze. And of course, this one, everyone gets this wrong. It's an evaporating, evaporating basin. Evaporating basin. Next. The liquid that dissolves the substance is called a solvent. The clear liquid that forms is a solution. This is all easy. Evaporating basin. Yes, that's correct. At stage one and two, sand oh, where's the sand collected? Filtration to remove the solid. Step two is going to get you your sand on the filter paper. Then which one is to collect the salt? Is going to give you, it's going to be your evaporation. When you evaporate, remember, this drops into salt production. You evaporate, evaporate, eight, evap, 80% of the water, not 100. Then you leave to cool. Crystallization occurs, crystals form, filter, and dry. You never wash a soluble one, but you can wash an insoluble salt. What happens to the water in stage three? It boils away as a gas. I even gave an equation. Look at that. H2O liquid is turning into H2O gas, and it leaves. Question number five, last one, guys. This was the one, this was on the GCSE, and it fooled a lot of people. By the way, I actually attempted this in my laboratory. I gave it a go. It doesn't work. If you do this legitimately, you form smoke all up the tube. You don't. Oh, yeah. uh, thanks for that. Um, you form smoke all the other tubes. You don't get a gap, but it's a, it's a nice idea. How many different elements? I've got nitrogen as an element, hydrogen as an element, chlorine as an element. If they asked me, so three elements, how many atoms are there? 
Well, I've got one, four, and one. So I've got six atoms. What bonding is occurring? It's ionic. That's a tricky one, that, because ammonium is plus and Cl is minus. This here is ionic, even though it breaks our rule of metal, non, of non metal, non metal. Breaks the rule. They do like to ask it. Identify the two gases. Okay, guys, this is thermal decomposition. So they've taken the solid, the ammonium chloride solid, and they've heated it, and they've got this is broken it in half. Thermal decomposition, and the gases, we're splitting this up. We're taking this ionic solid, and we're ripping it in half. Then I'm going to turn that NH4Cl into ammonia gas and HCl. It then, of course, cools down. So this is hot, so it turns into gas because it breaks the bonds, but then it cools down cools and then forms the solid again turns back into the salt quite clever that so nice easy one really once you got to grips with it and then what processes are happening decomposition at the bottom of the boiling tube and neutralization at the top people often ask me why is it neutralization because i have ammonia which is a base or if you like to call it an alkali yeah which is being added to HCl, which is an acid, and they're going to neutralize and form a salt. Now, this equation they love because this is one of the very, very, we know, acid plus alkali equals salt and water. But in this case, you don't get it. It's really unusual, and they do love asking you. Guys, that's the end of the webinar. Let's see if I can bring you back to my screen. We are at the end of my webinar. Let's see if I can uh, share screen. Let's turn that off and bring you guys back. Right, year 11. Thanks so much for sticking it out. I'm so sorry I overran one hour, 17 minutes. I really hope it was useful. It was one of those topics which loads of people found really, really difficult. And they feel like it doesn't need to be gone through. But it, honest to God, it, it was worth spending the time. I hope it was useful. Have a go at the preliminary booklet. Have a look at it. You should find that your uh, your grades will be better. You'll have a better understanding of all those kind of questions with practicals and these diffusions and heating curves. Do the best you can. Obviously, our next webinar is next week. Just to warn you, I've suddenly realized that I've scheduled one for the third, the fifth, uh, the fifth, the fifth of March, fifth of the March, and I'm not actually here then. So I'm, I'm going to have to move that one to probably the Wednesday evening. But, guys, I, it, this is really lovely. I've got loads of people. Lucas, Daniel, Dana, Juyi, Tenzi, Huishan, Winkit, Aiden, Winkit, Amira, all saying thanks. So, guys, thanks very much for coming. I really, really appreciate you guys being here to watch these. Uh, I really, really do. It's been lovely to hang out, guys. Have a nice rest of your evening, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, guys.